Hi, Farah. Hello. Hi, how are you? Yeah, good. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Looking forward to the session. Yeah. And, uh, what about uh, Kevin and uh, Michael? Um, are you waiting for, sorry, you're waiting for... Yeah, Farah, what about Kevin and Michael? They have not uh, joined. Uh, Kevin and Michael, yeah, sorry. Um, they are supposed to present cases, so I presume they're joining momentarily. Okay, okay. Um, but they should, they should be here. So, <laughs> those are two of the fellows at Mass General, so they each yeah, have a case. So. One of them I've seen myself, the other one I don't know. So it's a surprise to me. Yeah, we have the <laughs> Professor Singhal has joined and uh, uh, Dr. Raj Shakir has joined and uh, Professor Grisold has joined. And uh, Steve is there, yeah. I was trying to decide if I should tweet on the event. I feel like you could get a lot more um, people joining and perhaps a larger audience. Um, yeah. More advertising, because you've put so yeah. much work into it. Yeah, and it is open on uh, YouTube, so many people join on YouTube. Okay, fabulous. Yeah, so because that is going live on YouTube, so. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. Um... Hello. Hello, Gagandeep. Hi, hi. Yeah. Hello, so another Dr. two minutes we start? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Dr. Nath. How are you? How are you? Very well, very well. See. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, Ludhiana. Yeah, is bad. Code is really bad. CMC, DMC. Oh, yeah. oh no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, huge bad. numbers of patients. Huge oh, numbers. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's very sad. It's, uh, it's rampant. Do you have access to PCR testing? Yes. I mean, testing yeah. is, is abundantly available. Um, uh, both the antigen, the antibody, and the PCR. Oh, that's good. Lots of people are getting, you know, but the problem is, for instance, uh, this is both in, it's across the country actually, but um, see, our hospital has 1500 beds. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, after the COVID pandemic started, the bed occupancy has really gone down. And as of today, there are about uh, 450 occupied beds, mm -hmm. which is not good. And of them, 350 are COVID and 100. So people with other conditions are not coming with us. Not coming, yeah. That's been our experience too. Uh, so so yeah. uh, that's yes, a okay. big... Uh, yeah, uh, good afternoon, Professor Rad. Hello. Hello. I have to say... Hello, someone special to me. Farah, how are you? <laughs> oh, good. How are you? I'm fine. So many years. So many years. I know. I'm just trying to find you on the... There you are. Okay. Lovely, Lovely to see you. Yeah, it's been a long time. I feel like I saw you in India and then maybe um, once since then, but it's been a really long time. Uh, since Geneva, I think we only met once in India. Yeah, Geneva. Yeah, gosh. Yeah. How are things going? We're all right, Farah. Farah, just for everybody's sake, Farah worked very hard on the ICD-11. And she was, uh, at that time, um, well, I won't say, but she were, it was a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I, a different um she was a fellow she was a fellow a long time ago it's lovely to see you farah lovely to see yeah, you lovely to see you too i hope everybody's using the icd effectively yeah i, know, I, know. <laughs> yeah, I think we can uh, we can start gagan yeah 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 we can we'll start i think uh, everybody has joined so uh, welcome everyone so this is the sixth edition Oh, seventh. seventh edition, right. Yeah. Uh, thank you for correcting me. The seventh edition of the WFN Fine Neuroinfection Series. We have a speaker who's actually back from, from back home only. And, 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 and he's more Indian and more, more from our country than the US. Uh, permit me to say that 
Dr. Avindranath. Uh, but uh, before that, there are uh, a lot of formalities. We have some uh, very important uh, neurologists and uh, neurological specialists on the panel, the chairpersons. So I would uh, not take too much of time and request Dr. Chandrasekhar Meshram, who's been doing a commendable job. You know, he's, he's uh, really taken this series and the series is really well accepted. It is uh, very well followed across the world. So, so uh, Dr. Meshram, congratulations for that. And, and uh, please, from now onwards, do take it forwards from here and introduce the chairpersons and then the speaker and uh, presenters of the case, as also several of the dignitaries who are there on the panel. Uh, Dr. Meshram, please. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Gagan. Dear friends, good morning. Good afternoon, good evening, Buenos Dias, Bonjour. On behalf of Tropical and Geographical Neurology Speciality Group of World Federation of Neurology and Forum for Indian Neurology Education, I welcome you all for this seventh session of WFN Fine Neuroinfection Series. Warm welcome to today's speaker, Professor Avindranath. And to chair the session, we have Dr. Agastina Charvefeli from Ghana and Professor J.M. Kimurti from India. Agastina is currently president-elect of the African Academy of Neurology. She is a neurologist practicing in Accra, Ghana. She did her training at uh, Moscow State Medical University she did initially medicine, then neurology training, then received doctorate. And uh, she's fellow of uh, Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons. Uh, she has a uh, lot of interest apart from general clinical neurology, geriatric neurology, cognitive and behavior sciences, epilepsy, Parkinson's disease. So she's quite active. And uh, she's very active in WFN. She's an active member of uh, uh, Tropical Neurology Group. Uh, she's uh, uh, on the membership committee, neuroepidemiology working group, and uh, WFN neurology in migrants. Uh, welcome, Augustina. Thank you Another much. chairperson we have, Professor J.M. K. Murthy. He is uh, Professor Chopra student. He did, did his uh, DM neurology from PGI Chandigarh. And as you know that this series is dedicated to Professor J.S. Chopra. Dr. Murthy is currently clinical director and chief of neurology at Care Hospitals Hyderabad. Uh -huh. He's a president elect of Indian Academy of Neurology. He has a lot of publications. He has written four books and chapters in Handbook of Neurology and also in Neurology in the Tropics, which was edited by Professor Chopra. He was editor of uh, Neurology India and uh, his main area of interest are uh, epilepsy and uh, neurocritical care. Welcome, Professor Murthy. We also have invited uh, panelists, Professor uh, Farah Mateen, uh, who is from Harvard Medical School, Mass General Hospital, Boston. Uh, she did his MD and PhD from Canada. And uh, then she, she did a neurology residency at Mayo Clinic, and then she moved on for uh, fellowship in medical ethics at Harvard, then neuroimmunology, neuroinfection diseases from John Hopkins, PhD in international health from John Hopkins. And uh, she did does a lot of work in collaboration throughout Africa, Asia, America, a lot of public uh, education community programs and uh, she's uh, past chair of American Neurological Association, International Outreach Committee, and Global Health Section and Ethics Section. And uh, she has worked in the UN High Commissioner, uh, World Health Organization, and also she was involved in the ICD, 
ratings and uh, she had traveled to more than 35 countries and published more than 140 articles so it is a great pleasure that we have uh, uh, paramati uh, she was in india in 9, 2014 when i was a president of indian academy of neurology at chandigarh and she is uh, responsible for motivating two fellows uh, to present the cases today michael young and kevin kyle and welcome michael and kevin uh, they are also from uh, harvard medical school mass general hospital boston and uh, i would also like to welcome dr sunil narayan who is professor and head of uh, neurology at jipmer and he will be presenting case as well and we also have professor rat shakir uh, professor grisol uh, professor steve uh, professor b s singhal dr gagandeep uh, and well i welcome you all uh, for this uh, interesting session and encouraged by the interest of everyone and we plan to start series 2 uh, from 26 september Uh, with more interesting topics so that we can cover the whole spectrum of diseases and uh, this is a tentative program that we have planned and uh, it is uh, it will be changed and uh, finalized soon and uh, this time we are going to move in the regions and we are we are giving responsibility to organize the session region wise like every uh, two region will get two sessions and uh, uh, will rotate between uh, asia oceana american academy uh, latin america up uh, pan africa pan arab uh, so it is going to be very interesting uh, uh, situation and uh, good learning activity educational activity uh, series 2 from uh, 26 september and uh, wfn president uh, professor bill carol has uh, accepted the invitation to inaugurate uh, this session so we'll uh, uh start with the session and i hand over the responsibility to today's chair persons to carry on further proceedings and uh, once again welcome you all and uh, to this uh, extremely enlightening learning activity thank you very much thank you very much um, ashram it is truly um an exciting opportunity to take part in this series and i really do have to commend you um this is an excellent um venture and we do hope it keeps on and the interest continues and it's it's extremely necessary and so i'm very honored to be part of it i am just as honored to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker um professor avendrana um he has a very rich and extensive um uh, experience he combines basic and clinical research to study neuropathogenesis of hiv and endogenous retroviruses and um recently with the new viruses and diseases that we've had to contend with um ebola zika dengue and our current covid-19 um he received his medical education at the christian medical college in ludhiana india he has been in the past the director of the division of neuroimmunology and neurological infections and professor of the department of neurology from Hopkins University in Baltimore Maryland he is currently the clinical director and chief of the section of infections of the nervous system um, in the national institute of neurological disorders and stroke the national institute of health in Bethesda Maryland USA so with this um so that we get down to the issue at hand i would like to uh, welcome Professor Avendrana, and he's going to speak to us about the approach to neuroinfections. Welcome. Well, thank you very much um, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm really delighted to present uh, here uh, to this group, and let me see if I can share my screen here. Okay. Okay. I want to make sure that you can see my screen. Can you? Yeah, yeah, we can see your oh, screen. Okay. Yes, okay. we can. Excellent. So, first of all, I wanted to thank you for this invitation and I'm really very impressed with what uh, you've really accomplished with these lecture series and the uh, way that you've organized it and garnered worldwide attention 
for this. So I'm truly honored to be able to present uh, as part of the series. The second thing is I'm really delighted that you dedicated this to uh, Professor J.S. Chopra. And uh, he was someone who I knew very well. Um, uh, he and um, my father were both colleagues uh, at PGI Chandigarh, uh, where I, I grew up in, in that city. And I knew him uh, when I was a child. And later, when I was in medical school, I would come to PGI. When I came home, I would uh, round with him on neurology. So actually, my first exposure to neurology uh, was with him. And um, uh, so, and it's really a pleasure to see many colleagues uh, here and friends. Um, uh, who have joined in today. So today I'm going to talk to you about an approach to neurological infections. I'm located here in uh, right next to Washington DC in this uh, suburb uh, called Bethesda. And uh, this is a picture of the National Institutes of Health uh, where we see patients, this is a research hospital. So patients come here only uh, for purposes of enrolling in research protocols, but it's still uh, the world's largest research hospital um, and is um, currently functioning at 50% capacity because of COVID, but otherwise it's uh, usually very, very busy. So the objectives of my talk are to understand the challenges in diagnosis of CNS infections. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, how to use modern technology for diagnosis of CNS infections, and then what to do when all technology fails uh, to make a diagnosis. But the bulk of my talk will be in, in the use of modern technology for diagnosis of infections. So the classical triad of CNS infection that we all taught is fever, headache, and stiff neck. Um, but the problem with this classical triad is it works, but uh, not very well. Uh, there's substantial overlap with non-infectious syndromes uh, with these symptoms. And classical signs may not be present in patients with CNS infections. So let me give you a few examples here. So um, there are a lot of conditions that can mimic CNS infection. For example, you can get an aseptic meningitis, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. You can actually have very high fevers along with it. A herniation can look like um, it is an infectious process. And then you can have other autoimmune syndromes um, that can also mimic uh, CNS infections. And they often get misdiagnosed. Um, then the, the reverse is also true, whereby um, CNS infections can look like something else. For example, chronic viral infections can present as neurodegenerative diseases or autoimmune diseases. And I'll show you an example of that. Uh, CNS infections can have atypical manifestations in immune compromised patients. And again, I'll show you an example of that as well. Um, and then CNS infections can trigger autoimmune diseases. And certainly in the current epidemic, uh, the pandemic is um, quite clear that um, uh, um, the coronaviruses can trigger a lot of autoimmune phenomenon, especially that affects the central nervous system. And in some patients with known CNS infection, the immune response can far, um, uh, can be far out of proportion or misdirected. So in these cases, the infection is ongoing and the immune response is also taking place. And an example for that could be herpes encephalitis and NMDA encephalitis. So they can co-occur at about the same time, although it's triggered by the herpes infection. Okay, so <laughs> the conventional techniques for making a diagnosis are that we try to find the organism and we, if you can culture it, we'll try to culture it. If you can look at it under the microscope, we try to find the, the organism itself. If you can't find the organism, we look for some antigen of the organism that we can try to find. And maybe an example could be cryptococcal antigen, for example. If you don't find the whole organism, you'll certainly find some antigen related to it. Um, and if you, the other thing is that you can use a polymerase chain reaction to amplify the genome of the organism, whether it's an RNA or DNA, it can be amplified. So small amounts of it can then be recognized. Um, and if the organism is not present, you can certainly look for antibodies to the pathogen. But again, uh, if it's a unique pathogen, the antibodies are useful. If it's a ubiquitous um, organism, then the antibodies may not be useful. 
But so although these conventional techniques work for majority of our patients, uh, there are um, multiple problems. Um, for example, we know that in acute infections, time is brain and early treatment is key. Uh, however, diagnosing CNS infections is early on is not that easy. Um, in patients with herpes and cephalitis, the PCR may be negative in the first few days, so you have to keep repeating it. Um, the in patients with bacterial meningitis, oftentimes, and there would be there may be partially treated meningitis, so finding the organism can be hard. Sometimes the organism is intracellular, for example, in listeria, so you may not actually find it in uh, body fluids. Um, and then, for example, with fungal meningitis, the organisms are stuck at the base of the skull, so you may not find them in a spinal tap. And, um, uh, and then patients with brain abscess, it may not always be possible to do a biopsy of the brain, and hence one has to look for organisms in extracerebral sites, and then hope that what you find there is what is present in the brain. So there are multiple challenges in trying to diagnose these patients. So there are some modern technologies that are available. They are still not 100%, but at least they're a step in the right direction. And I'll show you multiple examples of how we can exploit these techniques for making diagnoses in patients that are otherwise hard to diagnose. So if you want to look for antibodies and you don't know what the antigen might be, you can use two types of technologies. One is phage display and the other is peptide array. And I'll go into it in a little bit more detail. If you don't know what the organism is, you can do the sequence everything there and then try to align those sequences and it's called next gen sequencing. And if the organism is not available and sometimes the antibody titers are not good, what you can do is you can look at cellular immune responses. So here you can clone and sequence the B and T cell receptors and then try to align those and try to see what the uh, organism might be. So this is still a relatively new technique, so I'm not going to talk much about it because it's still in a development phase. So I'm going to start with phage display, and phage display libraries are, so phage is a, a equivalent of a virus that infects bacteria, and since it grows so rapidly in bacteria, you can, and it's a very simple organism, so you can put a gene of interest, and you can amplify it to large amounts that way. So what people did is that they put all kinds of peptides into these bacteriophages. So you can just imagine uh, you know, that you have um, uh, every permutation and combination of an amino acid and a peptide of a defined length. So let's say 30 amino acids, and you can have every single type of um, uh, amino acid and every combination possible um, in separate a phage and bacteria. So each one has only one single gene for a single peptide, but since you can grow these phage to such large amounts, you can potentially have all of them in here and in a library. So now if you take, uh, you can, uh, your antibodies are with maybe your spinal fluid or blood, and you put it on these phage, it'll bind, the antibodies will bind to the phages. And, uh, and then you can wash them and whatever is stuck now you can sequence it and you will know what the um, uh, antigen of interest is that the antibody is binding to. So you really don't even need to know what the pathogen is as long as you have the antibodies. And now you have to analyze the data because yeah, people are immunized with all kinds of things and there are other known organisms that people are exposed to. So you have to now sift through all of that to try and find out if there's something unique here in this patient. So it's so also an example where we use the same kind of an array, except here, uh, Ben Larman, who's at Hopkins, he um, selected these phage display such that only those peptides are expressed uh, that relate to non-human sequences and to viruses in the uh, database. So that's a little bit easier to do because you're not starting off with a very large library and you're not pulling out a lot of other auto uh, antibodies, but you're just looking for those that are non-human sequences. So here's a patient where this was 
helpful to us. Um, so we saw a young gentleman who had uh, pan encephalitis. It was a chronic condition and he had progressive dementia with extrapyramidal uh, features. So he uh, presented initially with loss of balance and uh, had psychomotor slowing. And um, he had, uh, was an individual who had immigrated from India uh, to United States and he was a computer engineer. Uh, he had made multiple trips to India because his father was ill. And, um, uh, but um, uh, at, as his neurological condition progressed, um, it was thought he had multiple sclerosis because there were some white matter changes in the brain and he was treated as though he had MS. And I did a brain biopsy and they found that it looked like uh, there were some infiltrates in the brain and it was thought to be autoimmune. So he's received all kinds of immune monetary therapies. Ultimately, uh, the patient uh, died. And this is what his MRI looked like. As you can see, there was massive amounts of atrophy here. There's some white matter changes, certainly not classical of MS at all, but they thought maybe it's primary progressive MS and they treated him uh, for that possibility. So we then looked at, um, at the phage display library with Ben Larman and we sent him a CSF and serum and he ran his library um, because we had a high suspicion that this could be some kind of infectious process. And when he ran it, he said that it looks like this patient has antibodies to dengue. And that was the highest titer of antibodies to everything that else that he looked at. And a lot of peptides overlapped with dengue over here. So that came us, to us as a surprise because this presentation had nothing to do with dengue at all. Um, and then uh, Ben Larman compared a CSF to serum and found that the antibodies were enriched in the CSF compared to what we are present in the serum. So there's intrathecal synthesis of antibodies here. So that suggested to us that we need to go back and now see if dengue can be found in the brain or not. Uh, also in the CSF, it, there was, um, he had 15 oligoclonal bands um, and he had uh, increased IgG synthesis and the IgG index was also elevated. So I think this also misled people to think that maybe this was an autoimmune phenomenon, but actually all these antibodies were directed against dengue. And I should also tell you that we went and did PCR on a CSF. A CSF had been sent to the CDC for a diagnosis of all these arboviruses. People have suspected that possibility. And so infection had been looked at high and low in this patient and never found anything. So all PCRs were always negative. Okay. When we looked at the brain, the brain was loaded with virus. So you could, by immunostaining, you can see it's present all over. It's here in the, uh, in the endothelial cells, there are these microglial nodules you can see. And um, so there was immunostaining of this all over the place, but none of it was leaking into the CSF. So, um, uh, and then by in situ hybridization, also using a probe uh, to the virus, we could find uh, RNA in the uh, tissue as well uh, and in multiple places uh, within the brain. So uh, then we sequenced the virus and we found that it was a, um, a, a dengue uh, serotype one and, um, and it matched with his travels to Tamil Nadu in, in India where his father lived. And there was an outbreak of dengue one at about that time. And most likely that's how he got it because the sequence matched exactly with the one um, that was isolated from that region. So, uh, so what I would like to say is that um, here is a case of a very atypical presentation that, of a chronic encephalitis that was mistaken for an autoimmune syndrome and he was treated as such. Uh, but really what he had was persistent viral replication within the brain and that was not leaking out into the CSF. Okay. And the only way we were able to diagnose it was looking for antibodies using a phage display library that was an unbiased way of looking for, uh, for antibodies to the viral pathogen. And I like to tell you that that's not unique to this uh, dengue patient. Um, I believe that there are a lot of other viruses that probably similarly present. 
uh, with chronic neurodegeneration that get missed. And the perfect example, of course, is measles, where you have SSPE. And again, here you can uh, look at the spinal fluid. You'll never find the, the virus. But the only way to diagnose it is by looking for antibodies to the measles uh, virus um, in the CSF. But yet, if you look at the brain, it's just loaded with viral, uh, with the virus. So there's huge amounts of virus in the brain. Again, it doesn't form complete viral uh, particles, and that's why it doesn't leak out into the CSF. But you can get restricted viral replication uh, and transmission uh, within the brain. Okay, so another technique is, um, is a peptide array. And so what people have done is they said that, okay, instead of putting it in a phage display library, what if we make all these uh, numerous peptides and just put it on, an, uh, on a slide there. And now you can miniaturize these things to small amounts of peptides can be put in these real microscopic dots. And uh, then if the antibody binds to it, uh, you can recognize that uh, by a computer and uh, because it'll see these fluorescent dots, it'll quantify it. And it'll, and you know what peptide is in what spot over here. So that'll tell you, you know, what uh, antigen the antibody is recognizing. The disadvantage of this, of course, is that they're short peptides. So they have to recognize linear epitopes. If they're conformational epitopes, they're going to miss it. But uh, they can be very easily customized and made. So it is a uh, technique that can be easily adapted almost any place in the world. So. Um, so I'll give you an example of where this has been very useful in identifying the offending organism. So uh, there's this condition called acute flaccid myelitis, uh, which resembles polio, but it has nothing to do with the polio virus. And, um, but um, um, every two years, it seems to occur in some form of an epidemic and has been recognized throughout the world and, um, and occurs in, um, uh, although somewhat sporadic, uh, but yet um, it is uh, quite devastating, occurs in children uh, most commonly. Okay. And the cause of which was suspected to be an enterovirus, but has never been proven until recently. So if you look at the cases in the United States, again, every two years, there's a spike of these cases and usually occurs somewhere starting in, in August and usually by December it's done. And, uh, in, uh, and this year already there are about uh, 60 some cases of acute flaccid myelitis reported in the United States. And so 2020, we were expecting an uh, uh, epidemic again. And, but uh, with COVID isolation, we're not too sure how that's going to affect acute flaccid myelitis as well. There's several cases in the Washington DC area already. Okay, so, um, so Michael Wilson at, in UCSF used a phage display library, uh, just as I described to you earlier. And what he did was uh, he wanted to see if he could identify antibodies to any of these enteroviruses. And what he found was that there were two regions. Um, one is this VP1 and the other is this 3D region where he found a lot of antibodies in these patients. And, and he used spinal fluid from 42 patients with acute flaccid myelitis. And uh, so he said that, okay, there's an enrichment of antibodies against enterovirus, but he was unable to tell you exactly which enterovirus it might be because the overlap of these peptides was there with A71 as well as uh, D68. But he was able to narrow it down to say that, yes, this certainly suggests that it is an enterovirus uh, that could be the pathological agent. Uh, this was further taken up by uh, Ian Lipkin and Columbia University and uh, independently, he was looking at a, a peptide array and he made a peptide array in which there were, he identified peptides that were unique to enterovirus D68. And uh, so when he looked at that particular peptide here, and uh, what he found was that patients with AFM, again, these are uh, individuals uh, here is shown a panel of 20, but he analyzed again 42 patients. And what he found was that the AFM patients had antibodies to uh, enterovirus D68, uh, but not all the other controls that he used. 
So he then conclusively using this peptide based technique was able to uh, state that the offending agent is really enterovirus D68. Okay, so the key points here are uh, from these cases is that persistent viral replication can occur in the brain without viral detection in the CSF. And I think that's very important to remember. Um, the diagnosis can be made by showing intrathecal synthesis of antibody um, and um, uh, to a particular um, a peptide or a, a protein um, that may be derived from an organism. And phage display library or uh, peptide microarrays can be useful in identifying these organisms. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to uh, next generation sequencing and how that can be used for identification of a pathogen. So here you're dependent upon the genome of the, uh, of the virus. Um, and so if it's an RNA uh, virus, then you, you have to convert it to DNA, and you can use reverse transcriptase to do so. But once the DNA is formed, what you do is you fragment it. And, um, and these fragments uh, are then, um, there's an adapter that is uh, conjugated to these fragments, and each fragment has a unique adapter to it. And then this is called a library. So once you get this library, you then sequence it over and over again. You can also amplify the library if you want to. And, uh, and then you align these sequences with a known database. Um, and, uh, and then you can see uh, if it aligns with any of the uh, known pathogens. And sometimes if it doesn't align with anything, then you still have sequences that are non-aligned sequences and they could represent novel pathogens. So that's an advantage of this technique, but it's dependent upon the ability to get uh, RNA or DNA from the virus. If that is not available uh, in the specimen that you have, then the whole technique will fail. So I'll give you an example where this was useful to us in making a diagnosis. So we saw a patient uh, who uh, was on um, a, um, uh, had developed a, um, um, it was on a JAK-STAT inhibitor uh, and developed a fatal encephalitis uh, due to JC virus. And JC virus is known to cause PML. Okay. Um, uh, however, this patient had a very atypical presentation. As such, this patient was quite immune suppressed. As you can see, the, um, here's a CT scan, an MRI and a CT over a progression of a period of time. And uh, you can see at, a, uh, at the time when the patient had neurological symptoms, uh, the patient still had a normal looking MRI. By the time of death, the patient, the MRI and the CT scan shows massive amounts of edema, but there was never any evidence of demyelination in this patient ever. Okay. And at the time of autopsy, you can see here, uh, there's just herniation of the brain, uh, tonsillar herniation. The brain is very congested over here. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, on EM, we could find some viral particles here uh, that resemble JC virus. Um, but if you looked at the uh, amount of JC virus that was present there, this is in the spinal fluid. Um, initially, it wasn't even, even though in your graph it appears small, it was still 500,000 copies. It went over to a million copies in the CSF. Um, and this patient was, and they were, we were never sure of the diagnosis um, until autopsy, even though we were finding huge amounts of virus because the clinical presentation was so atypical. And, uh, and it was thought that maybe this patient had some kind of a yeah, hemophagocytic syndrome. Um, and the patient also had a fever on top of that. So, and the patient had received all kinds of immune suppressants because they thought this patient has some kind of an autoimmune syndrome even though the virus was present, this patient was continually treated with more and more immune suppressive agents uh, over a period of uh, six to seven months. So, so we were very curious as to why is it that this JC virus is presenting so atypically? So we then did next generation sequencing. And what we found was that 
um, uh, that number one, that the, uh, the viral load in the brain was just unbelievable. So it's not millions, it was billions of copies of virus is what you could find in different parts of the brain, right? Uh, so there was huge amounts of virus everywhere. And when we sequenced it, we found that there was a uh, very unique sequence here in the regulatory region. And uh, what this patient had was a 12 base pair insertion in the T protein. And uh, this insertion meant that it had a, an extra transcriptional binding site in the virus. So that means there are more uh, um, proteins could bind to it and then cause massive activation of this virus. Okay. So its ability to be able to replicate is better than other known JC viruses. Uh, and that is the reason that it replicated so rapidly within the brain and uh, was present in all cell types and uh, not just oligodendrocytes. Okay, now here's one that I took from the literature. And here again, next gen sequencing was useful in making the diagnosis. And this is a 34 year old man with A gamma global anemia and chronic uh, meningoencephalitis for a period of three years. And so you can look at this brain here over a period of three years, there's massive atrophy of the brain um, that occurred over here. And, um, and this patient underwent massive amounts of investigation. Everything was negative, you know, for all kinds of infectious organisms that people could think of or could possibly do in a clinical lab, everything was done and nothing was really found. Okay. Did a brain biopsy and sure enough, there were T cell infiltrates in the brain. But again, the diagnosis couldn't be established even by histopathology. So, uh, and this is from Michael Wilson's uh, lab and at UCSF. So what they did was they took 250 microliters of CSF, did next gen sequencing on it. And they identified that the offending agent was this Kaki uh, Valley virus um, that was uh, the cause of this encephalitis. So you can see that an unbiased sequencing with the small amounts of fluid can actually reveal the diagnosis and you could save yourself this huge amount of effort of spending thousands and thousands of dollars and doing all these massive amounts of investigations. Okay, here's another one, uh, again, uh, from Michael Wilson's lab. And um, this is a very interesting patient, uh, made multiple trips uh, to, um, uh, Puerto Rico and then to Florida. And this patient had, this was spiking temperature continuously. So people suspected that there must be some kind of a infectious process, but they could never find it. Yeah. Um, and ultimately the patient went into status, had to be on pentobar coma uh, for intractable seizures, um, was in the ICU. And then they did deep sequencing of the serum and CSF and found the uh, organism and finally treated with antibiotics and this patient actually got better, was able to ambulate independently and um, uh, recovered um, to a large degree. Um, and, um, and they show you that on the brain biopsy here, you can see that there are uh, you know, infiltration of T cells. Uh, you can see there is uh, this meningitis uh, all encasing the brain stem over here, uh, all around, uh, enhances all around the brain stem. So there's no doubt that the patient has some sort of meningitis, but finding the organism was very hard. What they found was that it was a leptospirosis, and but the only way to diagnose it was by next generation sequence. So it was a, a treatable condition. Okay, now this is the patient that we saw here at NIH, and um, this is a patient who had recurrent meningitis. Uh, she was a 41-year-old um, uh, ICU physician, and, um, uh, and her symptoms started at 26 years of age, and since then, she'd been getting back pain and neck pain, malaise and fever, which will last two to three, uh, I mean, about three days or so, and then she get better, and then she again get similar kinds of symptoms. It's gone on for many, many years, okay? and no specific diagnosis was made. 
she was born in Mumbai, immigrated to the US at 22 years of age. And she had uh, lived in multiple places in the United States. Um, and uh, she had converted from PPD negative to positive in 2002. Um, and so she got treated with um, for tuberculosis on multiple times, okay? Um, but it really didn't do anything. She'd been treated with, uh, when, uh, well, cyclovir because she had had uh, a previous episode of, uh, um, of zoster and that didn't uh, change anything either. Um, however, uh, if you look at her spinal fluid, she had an elevated protein and some pleocytosis and she had elevated IgG index um, and there were oligoclonal bands, but the oligoclonal bands were identical in the CSF and in the serum. And she had multiple MRI scans um, and still could never really find an organ. And you can see she had huge amounts of infectious disease work up here and everything was negative um, over a period of um, 15 years. Okay. okay. And just to show you here, she, uh, you know, all kinds of treatment. And then, uh, it's, then people thought maybe this is autoimmune. So she started getting all kinds of um, immune suppressive drugs, methotrexate, anakinra, etanocept, and uh, really didn't do much. And then ultimately next gen sequencing provided the diagnosis and a specific treatment was provided. Um, and if you look at the MRI, there was some arachnoiditis over here and maybe a cyst-like structure that was recognized, but it was thought that maybe this is all pachymeningitis. Um, and uh, with the GAD enhancement retrospectively, this probably should have given us a clue to the diagnosis, but uh, it was, uh, um, it was uh, missed. So then we did next-gen sequencing here. This time we used 500 microliters of CSF. And, um, and we found uh, a lot of sequences that were non-human, but when you do next-gen sequencing, you find a lot of contaminating sequences. So you have to um, remove this contaminome, so to say. So you get rid of all of that. And we're left with about a little less than 3000 sequences and they all match to tinea solium, 100% similarity. So what this patient had was cystocercosis and uh, that was missed. And it was next gen sequencing that provided the diagnosis. So she went, you know, good 15 years without a diagnosis. And this could have been established by uh, next gen sequencing very early on. But, uh, although it probably wasn't available in 2002. Okay, so, yeah, so uh, these modern techniques are superb in trying to establish diagnosis, and they need to be used more extensively and made available to us more extensively. However, sometimes everything fails and then we need to treat patients empirically. And I'll give you one example of that um, as well. So here's a 52 year old male who developed headache, fever, vertigo, ataxia and dysphagia over a period of three, three days. So suggesting that this patient had some kind of a brainstem lesion. And sure enough, the MRI scan shows this enhancing lesion in the pons and the medulla here uh, in the medulla really. And you can see here in the medulla, it has a dumbbell shaped um, uh, lesion here and it's enhancing, uh, this is the post contrast scan. And so here, because it's an, uh, an abscess sitting in the brainstem and nothing is leaking out into the CSF, diagnosing thing by CSF examination is next to impossible. So the CSF is normal. Doing a biopsy of this is very difficult. Uh, it could actually be fatal. So what does one do in this circumstance? So you would suspect this is an infectious process and you would suspect that, okay, of all the infections, the presumptive diagnosis could be listeria. They so said, we don't want to miss that. And so you treat them empirically, even when you don't have a, a diagnosis uh, and made by a laboratory technique. So in this case, we treated the patient empirically with uh, uh, vancomycin and ampicillin for 21 days. There was complete resolution of symptoms and the patient recovered completely. So the um, thing about listeria and cephalitis is that it can, is usually preceded by GI infection, but in this case, really those symptoms were 
not there. Uh, it's an intracellular organism, hence it's very hard to culture it. And uh, it doesn't respond to most antibiotics. So you have to really use um, vancomycin and ampicillin. Um, and if a person is allergic to ampicillin, then you can use um, Bactrim, but you will have a synergistic effect. So you have to use both of them together in these patients. And the reason it ends up in the uh, medulla is because it travels from the GI tract along the vagus nerve to end up uh, over here in the brainstem. And that way it evades the bloodstream and hence, uh, and the CSF pathways. Okay. okay, so I'm going to conclude by saying that uh, clinical acumen and most clinical laboratory techniques are insufficient to diagnose CNS infections in many cases. Okay. And the use of high throughput techniques are critical in establishing a diagnosis. And these could include uh, antibody detection techniques that are unbiased, uh, which is the peptide array or phage display. Um, if uh, then cellular immune responses uh, can be categorized by sequencing uh, the repertoire of uh, B and T cell receptors. Um, and that is still a technique that is still being developed. Uh, and then the organism itself, if one could find it uh, by next gen sequencing. So I'd like to acknowledge a, um, some of my colleagues here. And so we've uh, newly established a consortium for undiagnosed neuroinflammatory diseases. And uh, this will be based uh, in at NIH. And I'm the principal investigator of this uh, um, consortium and uh, along with, uh, so we have multiple PIs here and um, uh, Ian Lipkin at uh, Columbia uh, University of, at Columbia University in New York, um, uh, Michael Wilson at University of California in San Francisco, and Naresha uh, Salagama at University of Washington in uh, St. Louis. Um, and so um, I'll end here and take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Prof. Nath. That was highly enlightening, and I'm sure for many of us in the audience, also extremely sobering, um, because it, it does show that it is a lot harder than we think it is to make the diagnoses that theoretically uh, we have often assumed to be relatively simple to make. Um, so there are some questions in the uh, question and answer box. Uh, yes, I can see them. Main um, ones. Yes. All right. So, um, Prof. Nath, perhaps it would be easier if you go through the questions. I'm sure some of the answers were given during the talk itself. And so please um, go through the questions and see if you can answer uh, some of them. For example, the time for the pathogen determination and so on. Oh, okay. So I'm just reading them for the first time. So um, what's the yes, turnaround time for pathogen determination by phage display? So these things are research uh, techniques. So it's not like one can order them and they'll uh, show up. So, and I think that's, I think they have to be established in, in research labs. And so uh, the time, I mean, theoretically one should be able to do it within a week, but uh, in research labs is not the same as in a clinical lab. And so some postdoc has to be put on the project. It's not like samples are coming every day. And so it takes a while to be able to establish these things. There's a fair bit of bioinformatics involved. So I think it, um, uh, at least currently, these things are not available in real time. Um, if a chronic uh, dengue encephalitis was diagnosed early, what treatment would have been given? So I think, uh, unfortunately, there isn't a treatment for a lot of these viral infections of the CNS. But establishing an early diagnosis saves a lot of headache because these patients are going from physician to physician, there are all kinds of testing and invasive things are being done to them. And so establishing a conclusive diagnosis can actually save the patient a lot of heartache that way. And so, um, so I think making early diagnosis is still important. And fortunately, we need to still work towards making uh, good antiviral drugs against a lot of the pathogens uh, that infect the, uh, the brain. Um, Okay, the next question is, we found um, one dengue encephalitis, dengue three, and dengue myelitis confirmed by CSF-PCR. Do you think um, made the genome somehow cross to the CSF? Yeah, I'm sure that um, 
um, uh, you know, some patients, I mean, dengue does infect the brain. You can get uh, an acute um, encephalitis and uh, hemorrhagic encephalitis with uh, dengue. So there's no surprise that you're going to find dengue in the, in the CSF um, uh, in, in a number of these patients. But there are these rare examples whereby you can get restricted viral replication in the brain and it may not leak into the CSF. Uh, do you think COVID-19 can also uh, primarily attack the neuron and uh, difficult to be detected by PCR? I think what happens is that, uh, so, so far, the ability to detect um, SARS-CoV-2 in the brain uh, has not been fruitful. We've done a lot of it ourselves, and we haven't really found it. We looked at 25 brains, uh, autopsy tissues. Um, very rarely do you find it in the brain. Um, so I think most of what you're seeing is a post-viral uh, autoimmune type phenomenon. There's a lot of inflammation in the brain of these patients. And so, and that is the other problem with viral infection There's oftentimes the virus is gone, but um, a lot of immune activation persists and that can cause a autoimmune type phenomenon. Okay, uh, next is dengue one such presentation and onset will be seen in what percentage so we don't have any, uh, these are isolated cases. So we would love to hear from you uh, about your difficult cases. And hopefully we'll be able to gather more data about the prevalence of these kinds of things. But I can tell you, once you diagnose a rare patient, turns out it never is rare. <laughs> then a lot of other people will find them. Yeah. Okay, how huge library is created for next generation sequencing? Yeah, so there's no limit to it. Uh, you know, you can do uh, 100 million reads if you want to, uh, or you can even do larger amount of reads. So it's uh, amazing. These libraries can be very large in size. Should spine MRI be done in every patient with brain neurocyst treated empirically? So I'm not the expert in, in cystocytosis. And, um, but I don't think that unless it's symptomatic, people will do a spine MRI, I think you would do it if there were symptoms that would relate to the spine. Um, but that would be my take on it. Okay. Um, do you have uh, samples of um, um, metagenomic sequencing from around the world? Do you take samples? So, um, and so I think um, uh, Michael Wilson has established a um, not clinical lab. If you go to the US, UCSF website, uh, they are able to do uh, sequencing uh, in real time for specimens that you send them. And uh, they do have a charge for it, but um, uh, it can certainly be done. Uh, and, but that's the lab, at least the one I know of that uh, is available now. Um, at what point, uh, okay. Yeah, any role for IV, IG and dengue encephalitis? If the virus is still there, then IVIG is um, uh, not going to be terribly helpful. People think that, yeah, maybe if you have neutralizing antibodies, you'll block it. The problem is these patients already have antibodies. So once they are infected, they already have pretty very high titer antibodies. The antibodies are not protecting them. So giving them more antibodies is not really going to do anything unless you make a monoclonal and it's a very high affinity neutralizing antibody, then maybe there's a chance. But otherwise, IVIG. It's useful if it's an autoimmune syndrome, but it won't block the virus. Um, at what point will NGS be available for stable outpatient cases with chronic uh, current treatment? So I think some company needs to take it up and you need to get um, develop clear certified labs and make it available. There's no reason why it cannot be done, but you need some commercial company to take it on. Uh, like, thank you very much. Uh, how common is leptospirosis in Florida? Uh, it's not that uncommon, actually. <laughs> uh, but doesn't always cause CNS symptoms. So um, uh, that part is rare. Uh, was Listeria missed by any panel? So the ME panel was not done uh, for Listeria. Listeria was diagnosed on a clinical basis because you want to make a very quick diagnosis and treat very quickly. But then you can't afford to even wait for days uh, patient can deteriorate right in front of your eyes. Same thing with herpes encephalitis. You can't wait for the PCR. If you suspect a patient has herpes encephalitis, you treat them with a cyclovir, then worry about the PCR testing later. 
Yeah, there's very little to lose otherwise. Um, uh, what might dengue be? Uh, why might dengue be a chronic infection? Infection through life by other serotypes. Um, yes, I don't know the answer to that. There must be host susceptibility factors that probably account for some of these things, um, but um, that remains uh, unanswered. Uh, for the case of rhombin encephalitis, is empirical treatment for listeria fails, what would you recommend? <laughs> so, um, uh, well, if um, it, I would then go and biopsy it. If your empirical treatment is saying you really need to go to the tissue and try to find out what the organism is, because otherwise you're just shooting in the dark and your patient's deteriorating in front of your eyes. I mean, it could be anything. It could be uh, leptomeningeal cancer. It could be, you know, all kinds of things. It may not be an infection. So you have to uh, get tissue diagnosis in these patients. Uh, any biomarkers uh, now to detect COVID in the brain? Uh, no, none that I know of. Um, so, um, um, but I'm sure over a period of time, things will become more evident. Okay, um, okay, thank you. I recognize the number of names of my friends and colleagues here. Thank you very much for joining in. Uh, would you expect Fatima, healthy? Yes. I'm really sorry to interrupt. Um, perhaps some kind of synopsis, because as you mentioned yourself, uh, next generation sequencing is, even in the best of places, is not readily available. And to be fair, the majority of patients will fall into, not to put it lightly, but relatively easily diagnosed. Um, so if you could put, just give us a small synopsis of the absolute uh, minimum of considerations that need to be made, tests that need to be requested if you have a patient with an unusual meningoencephalitic picture. Yeah. So, you know, every institution and your area of practice is going to be different as to what is available to you, right? So I think as a neurologist, what you really need to know is develop a really good relationship with your microbiology lab. <laughs> they are your friends. And so the microbiology and immunology lab, and once you understand what their capacity and capability is, uh, you can just routine testing can find a lot of these things. Sometimes what happens is if you just order a lot of tests, it goes to the microbiology lab and they say, well, the person really doesn't know what to do. So the assessment keeps sitting over there for a long period of time. So even if you have the organism, by the time they do something to it, it's all gone, yeah? But uh, if you have a good relationship with them and you can carry the samples to them, <laughs> you know, your chances of finding things actually goes up just by that alone. And so, but you know, common things, are, uh, everybody has access to a cell count, protein, glucose. I mean, these things are again, indirect measures, uh, but you still need to get to the organism. And um, so that, I think is key. Um, and if they can spin down the fluid for you and look for bacteria, if that's what you suspect, then you have a better chance of trying to find it. The volume of CSF you give to them can also matter. So I think um, and that is probably the most important thing is to understand the capabilities and capacities and use them to their maximum uh, ability. Thank you very much. Um, from the panel, are there any other comments, um, suggestions that can be made? Any comments from uh, Dr. Murthy, Dr. Raj Shakir? Uh, uh, I, ha I have a comment. Uh, how common is the chronic dengue encephalitis? Because we are not uh, aware of that concept at all. But your uh, pathology studies clearly shows that Dengue is a neurotropic virus. Yes, so that is what we would love to work with uh, some of you. And the purpose of showing that case is we don't get dengue in the United States. So the areas in the world where dengue is endemic, uh, if you have unusual cases of neurodegeneration in young individuals, I think yeah, this is something we should look at that possibility. So, so um, we'd love to collaborate with you and, um, and together maybe we can figure these things out. Uh, except, uh, visiting India during a dengue epidemic, is there any other clue for a clinical clue to suspect dengue and capnitis in this patient? So I've shown you the clinical presentation. Um, you know, it's a panencephalitis, it's cortical and subcortical. 
Uh, and uh, I suspect that it does not just dengue. I have another case with West Nile, looks very similar uh, in the same way. My guess is a number of these arboviruses probably do similar kinds of things. And so if you have these patients that don't fit a cl particular clinical pattern, they have oligoclonal bands in the CSF, they look like they have immune mediated encephalitis, but yet they're presenting with a chronic neurodegeneration. I think the combination of those two should make one suspect the possibility of an infectious agent. So, yes, thank you, Dr. Nath. Uh, excellent. Thank you for this excellent lecture. This is really uh, e extremely enlightening. I have, a, I have a very trivial question. If, if we have a patient who has an autoimmune encephalitis of some kind, is there a distinct possibility that this type of antibody production and antibody array uh, is is clearly distinct from infection, or could there be a bias towards autoimmune antibody production and infection? Yeah. But that's very trivial, the question, but excuse me, no, I'm not yeah, a big theologist. Right. <laughs> yes, so that makes a lot of sense. And so because this was an infection <laughs> a forum here, so I only showed you the arrays with um, uh, viral uh, antigens and peptides there, but you could make the same peptide in the same phage library can be investigated for looking at um, host antigens. So in the same patient where you don't know whether it's an autoimmune phenomenon or infectious agent, these arrays are totally unbiased. They don't really care. So they will pull down, you can pull down host antigens as well. And if you find you know, an MDA receptor there or whatever else, so you can uh, at the same time query autoimmune and infectious at the same time in the same individual. And sometimes you'll find both. You know, a patient with herpes encephalitis can have an MDA encephalitis sure, at the same yeah. time, right? So there's no reason why you shouldn't look at uh, autoimmune uh, phenomenon using the same techniques. Thank you very much. So, so this dengue patient, uh, did we do the conventional way, the ELISA and the neutralization tests, which are often positive in patients with acute dengue encephalitis? Yes, so the antibody will be in an endemic area, presence of antibody alone doesn't tell you much, right? Because a large population is already infected with it. No, I'm talking um, the CSF, CSF. The yes, cyber. so yes, so if you were to show intrathecal production of antibody, that could be helpful. And that is absolutely just same thing in, in SSP is the same thing. You get, you know, intrathecal production of antibody. And Don Gilman uh, used to talk about, um, uh, Don Gilden used to talk about uh, VZV the same way. If you show intrathecal production of antibodies uh, to a viral pathogen, that suggests that uh, there is entrapment of that organism within the brain, uh, CNS tissues. Uh, North that American autopsy study shows, uh, showed their antigen presence in the brain as well as CSA in dengue, acute dengue pain. Uh, yes. Yeah, Professor Raj any comments? Sorry, not really, no, I really enjoyed this. And uh, I think the question was asked uh, by Wolfgang, a very good question about the, the autoimmune ones and the panel for that. So no, as ever, uh, the presentation, Dr. Nath was exceptional. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, Farah. Thank you for having me here. Farah, any comments? Um, yeah, I, first of all, thank you very much. That was really, um, as, uh, as mentioned, humbling. And um, I had a question about the role of immunosuppression in potentially post-viral syndrome. So long-term neurodegeneration or demyelination, is there a role for some of our drugs on the market for multiple sclerosis, NMO, et cetera? Do they have any role here? Yeah. So you're yeah, absolutely right. Uh, Farah, we have a huge number of drugs now to attack every single <laughs> arm of the immune system. So uh, in these post-viral syndromes, uh, understanding the pathophysiology of them is so critical because we don't have to give, you know, suppress the entire immune system any longer. So you know, if you want to just target B cells or you know, certain types of T cells or cytokines or, or complement, we can do that now. So once we understand what are the key pathophysiological mechanisms, then I think we can uh, target it um, in a more judicious manner. But you're absolutely right. Uh, for the, all these post-viral syndromes, we really have to use uh, some of these drugs that are available to us.
Yeah, we have, if uh, there is any comment from Steve, otherwise we move on to the cases. And uh, it was a great presentation and a very good discussion, uh, Professor. I just want to thank Dr. Nath also. I, I, we all have cases in, in our career that we really wish we had done some unbiased sampling on undiagnosed neurodegenerative diseases with inflammatory cells. And this has been very, very eye-opening. So thank you. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Farah, would you like to take on uh, for the cases? Absolutely. So we're very lucky today to have three uh, distinct and I hopefully uh, very uh, provocative cases for the audience. And they're each um, separate cases. The first will be presented by a fellow in neurorecovery at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, excellent uh, case. I happen to have um, seen the case myself and Dr. Michael Young uh, will present this case. And I hope that there'll be uh, plenty of questions and um, uh, thoughts after the presentation. So uh, thank you very much to everyone today for presenting and there'll be three presenters. We'll start with the first case. So Dr. Young, um, we're ready for you to share your screen. Thank you very much, Dr. Mateen and the organizers for this wonderful opportunity and organizing this, this wonderful talk. I think you are not very audible. Can you speak loudly? Uh, Thank you very much to the organizers and to Dr. Mateen for coordinating this wonderful talk and uh, seminar and inviting me to speak. Can everyone hear me and see my slides? Uh, yes, we can. May I request you to uh, sort of uh, shift the lid of your laptop a little lower so that we can... Uh, Oh, yes, yes, yes. This is this is all right. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So this is a case of a um, right-handed man in his 60s with no significant past medical history um, or pre-existing neurologic deficits who developed a high fever several days after two cohabitant family members were diagnosed with COVID-19. Later that day, he was noted to be slightly confused. He would hesitate to answer questions and repeatedly forgot where he placed things, such as his eyeglasses. The following day, he was persistently febrile and continued to be more confused and perseverative and slow to respond. He was brought to a local hospital where he underwent COVID-19 testing and was found to be positive by PCR. He had no supplemental oxygen requirement or respiratory symptoms and was subsequently discharged home. After arriving home, he was noted to be more slow to respond, tired and taciturn, and he was noted to occasionally stumble without falling and he was showering for much longer than usual. And at times he appeared to have his right hand clenched. Over the following days, his speech became slower and less elaborate with occasional paraphasias. And over the following days, he demonstrated increasing difficulty making simple decisions such as what to have for breakfast. At one point, he started to look for a clock in his house and despite it being affixed to the same place that it had been for many years, was fixated on looking for it and could not find it. He tried to heat up coffee and didn't seem to know how to use the microwave and appeared to be puzzled by this seemingly mundane task. On another occasion, he went out onto his porch uh, without his clothing and he poured orange juice instead of dressing into his salad. His gait grew increasingly unsteady, culminating in an ambulance being called when he nearly fell and he was admitted for further evaluation. Other than Anise's son who had a seizure disorder of unknown etiology diagnosed at the age two, he had no other family history or neurologic autoimmune or genetic disease in his family or contacts. In terms of his social history, he's a retired welder 
with no prior substance use and lives with a wife and daughter. On initial examination, and this was about two weeks after his initial symptoms, he was alert and answered simple questions uh, for orientation, but was grossly inattentive and perseverative. His language exam demonstrated a non-fluent aphasia with difficulty naming high frequency objects and frequent phonemic paraphasic errors. He also appeared to have a receptive component to his aphasia. He had difficulty following even simple commands. His motor, sensory, and cerebellar examinations were intact. He did have rare intermittent myoclonus of the right arm, and a startle reflex was not exaggerated. In terms of his workup, uh, COVID PCR nasopharyngeal swab was repeated and again was positive. Inflammatory markers were abnormal, including an elevated D-dimer, ferritin, ESR, CK, troponin, fibrinogen, also with lymphopenia with an nadir of 0.79. Lumbar puncture was obtained that revealed acellular CSF with normal opening pressure, normal glucose and protein, CSF bacterial culture and smear and CSF serum and autoimmune antibody uh, panels were negative, as was the CSF HSV PCR. CSF IgG was normal with no oligoclonal banding seen. This was his EEG, which revealed abundant one to one and a half hertz left lateralized periodic discharges with diffuse delta and beta slowing of the background. Levetiracetam, lacosamide, and clobazam were subsequently initiated without interval improvement in this EEG pattern. This is his brain MRI that revealed a striking unilateral homo holohemispheric cortical restricted diffusion pattern on the left side of the brain as well as a more faint restricted diffusion of the left anterior caudate nucleus and left thalamus with corresponding increased flare signal, which we see in panel C. His brain PET revealed hypometabolism of the left cerebral hemisphere, the left thalamus, the left caudate, and the left midbrain that correlated with the areas of restricted diffusion seen on the brain MRI, as well as the T2 flare signal on the brain MRI. His cerebellum on PET showed decreased uptake in the right cerebellar hemisphere, likely reflecting a crossed cerebellar diastasis. Among the diagnostic considerations, autoimmune or para-infectious encephalitis was considered and so empiric IVIG and methylprednisolone were accordingly trialed. The patient's neurologic status nonetheless continued to progress with worsening aphasia, right-sided weakness, and spontaneous myoclonus involving the uh, bilateral arms and legs. Ultimately, he became mute and uh, with very low level of functioning. Two weeks after admission, uh, CSF RT Quick, CSF 1433, and T Tau returned positive, confirming a diagnosis of Creutzfeldt Jakob disease, and comfort focused care was initiated thereafter. While available epidemiologic data indicate that a substantial portion of patients affected by COVID 19 develop neurologic symptoms, of headache, delirium, anosmia, increased stroke risk, and encephalitis, the potential for COVID-19 infection to accelerate or exacerbate pre-existing neurologic disease or neurodegenerative disease is underexplored. This case offers an instructive lens through which these emerging unanswered questions might begin to be examined. <clears throat> 
What is CJD? CJD is a rapidly progressive dementing illness caused by the inexorable accumulation of abnormally folded proteins that are protease resistant called sialoglycoproteins. And these are native proteins in the cell that become misfolded, uh, also called prion proteins. Numerous studies of neurodegenerative disease and brain injury provide evidence that the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, including IL-1, IL-6, IL-12, and TNF-alpha by activated microglia or reactive alpha-1 astrocytes in the course of a systemic immune response may promote neuroinflammation and may accelerate disease progression in a wide range of disorders, including Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson disease, MSA, FTD, primary progressive aphasia, and even stroke. Interestingly, recent animal studies have demonstrated accelerated transition from the preclinical to the clinical phases of CJD or prion disease in settings of co-infection. Specifically, mice that were co-infected with peniomuris after direct CNS prion infections developed a polarized immune response, including elevated levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as interferon gamma and enhanced activation of alpha-1 astrocytes that significantly shortened the time to develop clinical signs of prion disease. Depending on the milieu of local stimuli, astrocytes in general may be induced to assume one of two distinct reactive forms, a neurotoxic alpha-1 phenotype and a neuroprotective alpha-2 phenotype. A1 astrocytes induce the rapid death and uh, neighboring damage to neurons and oligodendrocytes and may serve as a platform for the propagation of prion proteins. IL-1, TNF, and uh, complement 1Q are understood to be together necessary and sufficient for the induction of an alpha-1 astrocyte pattern. During the simultaneous clinical presentation of COVID-19 and other diseases, such as in this situation that we were faced with, we wondered whether the cascade of systemic inflammatory mediators due to COVID-19 might have accelerated the prion disease pathogenesis and neurodegeneration. And while the precise molecular mechanism in this situation is impossible to ascertain, one wonders whether the reports of concordant patterns of inflammasome activation and increased secretion of IL-1, TNF, and complement cascade in COVID-19 might have promoted activation of alpha-1 astrocytes, which in turn might have occasioned and accelerated prion disease pathogenesis and propagation. These observations support the importance of research efforts that are focused on intervening early in the course of COVID-19 to quell the potentially maladaptive, maladaptive systemic immune responses that may propel neurodegeneration. These observations also carry very important consequences for people with other neurodegenerative diseases afflicted by COVID-19 especially given increased vulnerability to COVID-19 in the elderly who are already disproportionately affected by neurodegenerative disease, concerted efforts to understand and mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on these populations are imperative. And here are some uh, references, which you can look at at your leisure. And uh, the published in, in press version of this talk, uh, of this case that, that is in press in the Brain Behavior and Immunity Journal. Uh, thank you again to the, to the panelists uh, and the organizers for inviting me and to Dr. Farah Mateen for also extending the invitation. I look forward to uh, conversation and questions around this important case. Thank you.
Um, thank you very much, Dr. Young. That was a very articulate and um, important presentation about thinking about COVID-19. And one question just to get us started, um, can you talk about how the original COVID-19 uh, in terms of the framing of the case and how eventually you came from the post-COVID neurology thinking towards, a, you know, thinking about the actual syndromic presentation and then coming all the way back to prion disease and how that like reshaping of the case led you to make the diagnosis. Yeah, those are excellent questions. We, we certainly have seen cases after COVID-19 of vague neurologic complaints and cognition, memory, mood, uh, usually many of those cases that we have seen of post-COVID-19 neuro neurologic complaints kind of are a static, uh, non-progressive, and in some cases, gradually improving neurologic symptoms. In this gentleman's case, the rapid progression of his symptoms, as well as the localizing signs that he had on his exam, pointed us to perhaps a more focal, discrete neurologic process that was superimposed upon his COVID-19 infection, perhaps related to it, but something beyond the ordinary post-COVID-19 neurologic symptoms that one, might, that one might see. The development of the myoclonus and the aphasia and right-sided weakness were particularly concerning to our team. And together with the abnormal MRI findings, which were quite striking of the uh, holohemispheric restricted diffusion and the hypometabolism seen on PET, uh, we really did wonder about um, a superimposed either autoimmune process or infectious process that might have been compounding his infection. And uh, we conducted a broad workup, a uh, range of uh, infectious diseases, uh, all of which were negative, and empirically trialed the IVIG and steroids, which were ineffective. Um, and as time went on, our suspicion for CJD uh, went higher and higher as we saw uh, how refractory this case was and how inexorably progressive it was. And then when we saw the 1433 and T-Tau and RT quick all returned positive. Uh, that did confirm our suspicion, unfortunately, that he had been infected with um, CJD. Thank you. Uh, um, thanks for the thorough explanation. Um, a question from the audience um, from Dr. Catherine Fong. And she writes, a great discussion, Dr. Young. I may have missed, um, but were interleukin biomarkers measured as part of this COVID-19 workup for this patient? The interleukin uh, level was not measured. However, other inflammatory markers, including uh, ESR, CRP, uh, ferritin, uh, his lympho lymphopenia, all pointed toward a systemic uh, immune response that was over-exuberant. Another interesting question. Um, did, you, did anyone go back and ask the family in retrospect, were there more subtle cognitive or behavioral changes that preceded COVID-19 that only came to light after the diagnosis was made? We did kind of try to press to see if there were such uh, even subtle findings. And they're really, the, the family did not endorse any kind of even subtle uh, cognitive or mood or otherwise neurologic complaints that had been uh, recognized prior to this. So al although it is possible that th this was kind of subclinical, subclinically progressing uh, until this point. Yeah, I guess a lot of people are spending more time at home in the, the time of COVID too, but this case was, I think, way back in April and May. So hats off for making that, that diagnosis very early on. Um, last question for you. Um, this is a question on thoughts on SARS-CoV microglial replication. This might be a difficult one in context of this case, but I'll just um, put it out to the panelists. It's also from Dr. Fong. What are the panelists' thoughts on SARS-CoV-2 microglial replication as triggering A1 astrocytes and potentially the theory that A1 astroglial reactivation precipitated CJD in this case? So um, think, uh, we can have comments from Avindranath uh, and uh, 
there are some questions about covid and we are going to have a full two hour session on covid in the series 2 <laughs> so maybe okay that sounds does anyone want to answer this one at the moment otherwise we'll move on to dr kyle um comments from to... professor ravindranath about the case and ravindra hi uh, okay well uh, sorry i didn't mean to interrupt but uh, it's a terrific case um very very fascinating and i may have missed it but you look for uh, an mda receptor antibodies and other types of auto antibodies in this in this case is that correct yes the autoimmune and perineoplastic panels are all negative MDA. and what about um uh, uh the and did you sequence the prp gene also to see if there were any familiar mutations the the prp gene was not sequenced because he had no family history of um of CJD uh but the the diagnosis was made on the basis of his 1433 and RT quick and T tau proteins being elevated because he was relatively young right to develop CJD so that's why I was wondering whether there may be a um a mutation there that may be uh in part responsible and this is a great case yeah thank you so much all right yeah, so I just wanted to add sorry and Yes, um to the question that was posed by Farah, um I don't know that we at any with, with any amount of certainty can answer any of those questions right now because we're still learning about the uh virus and what it does to the immune system, what it does to the nerve cells, um other cells. We do seem to see that it exacerbates pre-existing problems and sometimes the whole disease can present as the pre-existing problem um decompensated um so i think it is very possible that it precipitated a pre-existing condition but i think it will take years before we can properly answer all of these questions yeah, and, and quite frightening possibility that you know we can survive covid and then um, this can actually trigger other other scenarios um so um thank you very much again Dr. Young and um I guess we will now move to Dr. Kevin Kyle who is the autoimmune and advanced general neurology fellow at Massachusetts General Hospital and um he will present a a, a case for us as well so uh thank you very much Dr. Kyle Okay um thank you so much Dr. Mateen and uh thank you to all of the course organizers for the opportunity to speak this morning it's uh this morning for me this evening this afternoon for everyone else um it's a, it's a great honor it's my pleasure so um i think upon providing the the name of this talk i i said post infectious but perhaps it was a misnomer uh, it should more appropriately be called a, a case of a persistent para infectious inflammation um and i think the Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. Uh, we can't see you completely. Uh, if you can move the lid off uh, the laptop a little. Lower. Okay. Uh, yes. Now we can. Yes. That's okay. Okay. My apologies. No, to worry. Okay. So um, I think um, really the um, take home from from this talk, this case vignette, is more so going to be uh, the. constellation of difficulties with um therapeutic challenges rather than uh, more so of a a diagnostic conundrum so it's more of the uh, convoluted pathway of this patient so this is a case initially presented a uh, uh, 40 year old man back in may of 2016 um presented with headache he did not have a significant past medical history um headache was diffuse um the onset was gradual over a 3 month course um patient was found generally um over that time subacutely to be more confused and coherent and intermittently aphasic uh, also um possibly with a degree of dysarthria um he was not on any medications uh, family history was uh, fairly non contributory um this gentleman lived in a small town in Massachusetts but he was originally from Cape Verde um um where there he worked as a driver uh, for the governor and he had just immigrated to the United States 14 months prior to this uh, presentation 
Um, at the time of this presentation, he was working in a, a waste management facility. Um, prior to that, in terms of pertinent things that are perhaps uh, relevant, um, he had uh, visited his grandparents frequently, his grandparents' farm, where they had uh, many goats and uh, uh, cows, but no other animals. Uh, upon looking at the uh, documentation from the outside local hospital, um, his general physical examination, um, he was afebrile, he was hemodynamically stable, he was said to be just generally distressed. Um, um, in terms of cardiorespiratory and abdominal examination, um, these were said to be unremarkable. In terms of pertinent things in his neurologic examination, I think mostly was um, um, remarkable for being disoriented. Uh, aphasic um, and unable to, to follow commands. Um, otherwise, um, per documentation uh, at that stage, there was no other lateralizing signs uh, in terms of any uh, cranial nerve abnormalities or in terms of the remainder of his neurologic examination, uh, motor coordination, uh, reflexes, sensation and gait um, were not terribly remarkable. So um, moving on to kind of pertinent investigations. Um, this was the initial series of his non-contrast CT head demonstrated uh, multifocal hypoattenuating cystic appearing lesions throughout bilateral hemispheres. Um, and this is moving on to MRI that was actually done several weeks later. Um, do not have access to the original MRI, but um, then demonstrating on T2 flare, again, these multifocal cerebellar bilateral uh, cerebral lesions, um, uh, cystic in appearance, uh, some of which have um, T2 and T1 um, hyperintense um, uh, central lesions, some of which have um, surrounding basogenic edema. And then this is the T1 um, post contrast imaging sequences. Um, Again, some of which uh, predominantly on the left hemisphere at this stage, uh, demonstrating rim enhancement. Uh, and again, you can appreciate in some of the uh, posterior uh, parietal and occipital lesions, uh, T1 um, hyperintensity centrally. Moving on to um, relevant laboratory investig investigations from the serum HIV was negative, strongyloides uh, was negative. Quantiferin screening um, for TB was negative. Schistosoma antigen hepatitides were negative. Um, Cystocircus uh, immunoglobulin G uh, performed by ELISA was positive. Just relevant pertinent uh, additional details at that stage, a lumbar puncture was not performed. Um, then he was seen by ophthalmology and there was um, felt to be no ophthalmic involvement. So um, as alluded to uh, the the crux of this case is not that it uh, was necessarily a diagnostic uh, conundrum. The uh, neuroimaging findings um, were fairly typical for a uh, neurocystosarcosis, I think you'll agree. So uh, at that stage, uh, based on the clinical presentation and neuroimaging findings, uh, that diagnosis was made and the patient was initiated on appropriate um, anti helminth therapy with albendazole and the praziquantel um, with additional dexamethasone um, coverage. Um, so he was initially started on six milligrams of dexamethasone for a week and then followed by a taper. Uh, given at least clinical suspicion that some of these episodes of transient uh, right side predominant uh, paresthesias uh, were episodic in nature, he was um, covered with a levetiracetam as well. Um, after treatment, his uh, aphasia resolved, his mental status improved, and um, then he was discharged uh, eight days after this initial presentation. So um, shortly after discharge from the local hospital, um, he presented to, to MGH, and this is where he actually established care here. Um, so he presented with worsening headache, phonophobia, um, definitely with a positional component. That dexamethasone was restarted and increased to four milligrams twice a day. Um, anti helminth therapy was again restarted for a further 14 day course. Um, so, and he was initiated on after the dexamethasone, a slower taper over a course of uh, five weeks. So after discharge at this time, then um, six weeks afterwards, um, he was ultimately symptom-free at that stage. Um, 
but very shortly after discontinuing dexamethasone, again, developed severe headache, left hemi body paresthesia, is presented again to the local hospital, underwent a lumbar puncture at that stage, which was non-inflammatory. Um, his opening pressure was 23. He underwent a repeat MRI at that stage, demonstrating um, increase in uh, T2 flare signal around some of these lesions and including a new uh, area of uh, T2 flare hyperintensity, uh, indicating uh, more diffuse physiogenic edema around these lesions, probably a degree of increased uh, enhancement in some of these lesions as well. So at that stage, he was restarted on dexamethasone um, with again a taper. Um, due to economic reasons, the levetiracetam was switched to phenytoin at that stage. Um, on follow-up after this, his headache had improved. He was felt not to have any further seizures. Dexamethasone was ultimately stopped uh, at uh, one month after this presentation. He was kept on Dilant. So at this stage, there is interval uh, improvement in some of the uh, areas of visogenic edema, albeit with some uh, residual edema and with some residual uh, rim enhancement with some of these lesions bilaterally. So then in uh, September of um, 2016, uh, he ultimately presented again with a severe morning headache, vomiting. He was at this time started on prednisone followed by a taper. Um, contemporaneous imaging at that stage shows uh, again, a re-emergence or resurgence of the uh, visogenic edema and uh, more uh, exuberant um, contrast enhancements of these lesions. So um, again, um, he was treated uh, with prednisone followed by a taper follow-up clinically and radiologically in uh, November showed a recurrence. Uh, he complained of a recurrence of the right uh, hemisensory symptoms, headache. Um, Keppra was added at this stage. He was again initiated on um, anti-helminth therapy uh, followed by, uh, in addition to uh, prednisone taper. Given his very refractory course with uh, persistent inflammatory um, uh, lesions, at this stage, he was started on DMARD therapy uh, with methotrexate, uh, 7.5 milligrams. And, um, these are his images at that time. So subsequent follow-up um, in the few months that followed in February and in March, he was clinically and radiologically stable. So then um, continued on methotrexate, um, tapered down uh, around May, again, presented to clinic with recurrent headaches, these recurrent transient symptoms. Uh, his prednisone was once again increased. Um, his methotrexate was increased to 15 milligrams. Um, these are his images from that time, again, showing kind of worsening of these T2 flare lesions, ongoing uh, contrast enhancement. Um, so, so later in, in June 2017, now um, again, ongoing refractory headache, right hemi-sensory symptoms, increased Keppra, further increased prednisone. Um, again, just thinking about other external uh, possible etiologies that could have been modulating his, his immune system. HIV was rechecked, T cell subsets were rechecked. Um, his CD4 count was low. However, at that time was um, attributed to his chronic prednisone therapy and methotrexate therapy. So um, these are um, follow-up images at that time with uh, kind of more abundant, more diffuse uh, visogenic edema on T2 flare and still very avidly sort of rim enhancing uh, lesions predominantly in the left hemisphere. Um, so again, on high dose prednisone, um, maxed his, uh, increased his uh, methotrexia to 20 milligrams um, continue to have ongoing headache and ongoing kind of uh, visogenic uh, edema around these lesions and bilateral cerebral hemispheres. So at this stage, um, his, uh, his treatment was once again um, reconsidered given the ongoing chronic steroid dependent nature um, of these lesions. And of course that in fact seemed to be refractory to DMAR therapy with methotrexate the decision was ultimately made to, to start more um, um, potent uh, biologic therapy with TNF-alpha inhibitor therapy. So um, we had started adalimumab at that stage um, and that he ultimately started in October, 2017. 
So um, this are, these are images from around six weeks after initiation of that. And you can appreciate that there's uh, quite a significant, impressive improvement in his uh, visogenic edema, in addition to improvement in the uh, contrast enhancement, albeit with some residual uh, areas there of contrast enhancement. Follow up um, later in uh, February and again in July 2018, he was clinically stable and relatively uh, radiologically stable, still with some evidence um, of residual lesions there, of course. Um, later in 2018, he, um, for various reasons, missed a few um, doses of adalimumab. Uh, he experienced a resurgence of symptoms, right? Facial numbness, paresthesias, uh, aphasia, ultimately culminating in a, a generalized seizure. These are his images at that time. So a resurgence of T2 flare, uh, hyperintensity, visogenic edema, and an exacerbation of the contrast enhancing lesions. So after that, adalimumab was um, restarted, started another predno prednisone course and taper. Um, Around that time, unfortunately, did um, suffer a complication of avascular necrosis of the hip, um, secondary to his chronic steroids, unfortunately. So after restarting therapy, once again, resolution of the profound visogenic edema, improvement in the, the contrast enhancing lesions. So the last two updates from this patient are from December in 2019. Um, again, he was off adalimumab for, for six weeks um, due to perhaps uh, insurance reasons and uh, socioeconomic reasons. Um, he ultimately restarted several months later, again, with clinical radiologic improvement. This uh, course, again, was repeated later in the year, um, had been off adalimumab for six weeks, again, with uh, um, uh, an exuberant kind of worsening of his T2 flare lesions and ring uh, enhancement. Um, again, later in the year, we started on Humira with resolution. Um, I unfortunately don't have the uh, MRI images um, from those episodes, but um, follow-up um, afterwards has shown with resolution, with um, continuation of his Humira therapy, good improvement in, in his uh, MRI brain appearance uh, issue. So, uh, with that, um, I will finish. And I think, you know, important uh, points to draw your attention to from this case are um, obviously we know many cases of treated neurocystis or cosis tend to have um, quite uh, a robust and post, inf uh, post treatment inflammatory response. But this case is uh, unique in, in that it's so persistent, so stubborn to, to advance from uh, methotrexate. To, to adalimumab therapy. Um, there are very scant uh, reports um, about TNF-alpha inhibitor therapy in the context of post-treatment um, post inflammation in, in neurocystis sarcosis. So I'll be interested to, to discuss with the, the faculty and the panel if there are any other um, ideas about um, further kind of diagnostic impressions. Um, or further therapeutic considerations. And um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kyle. That was a very um, complex case. I think it was a good illustration of the neurologist's role after the diagnosis is made and all of the challenges that continue to occur in managing patients. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question you can answer, but I know in the U.S. healthcare system where um, this patient currently is, um, adalimumab is, um, I don't know the price of it, or um, I know it's definitely uh, off-label for this indication. Yeah. And so how challenging is it for this medication to be prescribed for a patient in whom it seems to clearly work? Um, you know, how much is it, how hard is it to get for a patient like this? And... Um, are there potentially alternatives that have a similar mechanism of action um, in this situation? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question and uh, highly pertinent to this case. Um, it certainly is very difficult, it's challenging. And of course, we're um, very reliant on, you know, our, our kind of team to, to, to plead a case to uh, and appeal to insurance companies um, and, obviously as a result in lapse in, in coverage and um, 
there, there have been lapses in this patient uh, being able to continue this uh, treatment, which are it's obviously uh, very important for its uh, continued kind of uh, resolution of his of his inflammation. Um, so in, in terms of um, alternatives that will be more economically viable, uh, difficult to say. Um, I can't say confidently that there's any alternatives that I think that will be easier that because it's this is obviously, as you said, very, very off label. And so we're sort of just pleading the case for a very esoteric indication for this uh, patient, uh, albeit proven in, in, in his case. So um, I don't know if, if anyone else has any ideas about alternates and ter alternatives in terms of immunomodulatory therapy, but extraordinarily challenging case. I think it's a can great I, example. Can I make a comment? <laughs> Not being able yeah. to get it. Um, Hello. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, Dr. Theodore Nash from the NIH, so he many years ago had initiated a trial of methotrexate, but, but the trial was uh, abandoned prematurely. And he seems to, at the NIH, he and Dr. Siddharth Mohanty, so they seem to be really kind of impressed with the effects of methotrexate. And a number of patients they have uh, on methotrexate. And whenever they try to stop the methotrexate, you know, the edema around these lesions rebounds. Mm -hmm. and, and they have uh, presented these uh, cases time and again. The use of uh, TNF-alpha inhibitors, uh, that... Again, the same group has experience and they have actually published it also, but that's a different uh, agent. I think it's called uh, atarinacept or something of that sort. And uh, this uh, experience is limited to patients with uh, extraparenchymal cysticercosis, that is the subarachnoid variety, which is very difficult to control. They have a lot of inflammatory symptoms and they have been able to control these uh, inflammatory symptoms with uh, uh, the TNF-alpha inhibitors. But uh, in the case of uh, parenchymal cystic, parenchymal, and there were not too many lesions, but, but they, you know, whenever you try to reduce steroids, uh, the, the, inflammation and the edema came up again. Part of it can be attributed to steroids because whenever you stop steroids in patients with cysticercosis, there is a little bit of rebound edema and that's well documented, which is why these patients require long courses of steroids. So, I mean, the experience of TNF alpha inhibitors to the best of my knowledge in parenchymal cysticercosis, I've, I've really not heard of it, but, but certainly, I mean, the, the, the temporal relationship in your case is very striking. And, and then if you extrapolate from extra parenchymal cysticercosis, uh, definitely the benefit has been there. So, so I think uh, this is one of the newer and uh, interesting, but nevertheless expensive uh, options in the management of uh, uh, recalcitrant edema associated with cysticercosis. Can I make a comment? Uh, uh, this is the usual course, uh, course of a patient with multiple high load, uh, parenchymal high load cysticercosis. They do, we know, uh, we, what we do in this, uh, whenever there is the, usually the candidate, we give a short course and then tap it. Because this worsening of condition seems to do due to degeneration of uh, viable cells. So from time to time. So I, my, our experience, we use uh, steroids during the course of worsening and we manage this successfully. Can I ask you a question, please? Hello. Um, to uh, Dr. Kyle and to the new immunologists on the panel. It's a little bit of hindsight, but I was wondering if at the initial stages of diagnosis, the dose of steroids or the immunosuppressive therapy that was used in the beginning, if it was higher than it was, because it seemed like quite a um, small dose 
perhaps, and again, this is pure conjecture, but perhaps it could have um, reduced the likelihood of recurrence. I don't know, just maybe someone else has a comment to add to that. Yeah, so there is, a, there is a trial by Hugo Garcia from Peru, and this was published in Epilepsia. And they, they looked at uh, the duration of administration of steroids. And, and they clearly found that a longer duration uh, of administration of steroids, uh, say for about uh, four to six weeks, is better than short durations of uh, steroids, which is two to three weeks. So, so I think, uh, yes, uh, I, I think perhaps the inflammatory symptoms would have been lesser, at least in the beginning, if we could have given a longer course of steroids. What difference what would it have? Doses? Sorry? Higher doses as well as longer durations. But what difference would it have made in terms of the long-term evolution of the whole thing? I mean, it's difficult to say because, you know, I mean, they, this is really long term, the, the kind of uh, the evolution, the temporal evolution that you presented is really long term. So, so it's difficult to say, but yes, certainly there is a, a trial which compared long term and short term high dose versus low dose, and they found better results with long term and high dose steroids. Yeah, I think that, yeah, I agree. I think that's a very good point. And um, I myself had wondered uh, retrospectively if it would have had some of impact on the course, at least if there was a, a longer duration of initial dexamethasone. So I think that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, okay, Vindranath would like to make some comment? Uh, sure. So I really enjoyed this case, very, very interesting. and. Uh, Theodore Nash was mentioned earlier. So I've had the opportunity of seeing a lot of cases with him over the last 10 years and um, yeah, since recently retired. So yeah. that experience has kind of been lost. But nonetheless, um, the two things that come to mind, one is that along with them, we've used anakinra as another steroid sparing agent. And that's an IL-1 blocker. And um, in these tough cases, it actually works really well. So in fact, that cystisicosis patient that I presented earlier, we had managed with anakinra. And, um, and, uh, and some of these patients require one to two years of treatment before you can really uh, take them, taper them off the anti-inflammatory. So it can last a very long time. Uh, then the other thing is that, um, the other thing I learned from him is that uh, usual recommendations for the antiparasitic agents are not long enough and that he prefers treating them for much, much longer periods of time. And so that's also worthy of consideration that maybe there's some viable cyst still there um, and would another course of treatment be helpful or not? Um, although it's true that the dead scoliosis could still keep uh, producing an inflammatory response, um, but if it's, uh, there's still something viable, we might as well get rid of it. Well, thank you, Dr. Neff, um, and thanks, Dr. Kyle. So I think um, in the interest of time, maybe we'll move to the third case. And um, uh, thank you again for the interesting uh, therapeutic dilemma as well. <laughs> thank you, everyone. So um, so I'll let, uh, let the next person um, introduce Dr. Narayan. Thank you very much. Dr. Murthy, uh, can you take up the last case? Uh, Dr. Narayan is a professor and chair at the Department of Neurology, Institute, Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences, Pondicherry. Uh, I request uh, Sunil to present his case. Uh, so, I would, um, uh, try to give that. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, opportunity to join uh, in this uh, very, very important uh, seminar. All of you have carried the day-to-day -day tropical neurological problems to uh, a very uh, high scientific levels of managing it. So I'm, uh, uh, so uh, we are just chipping in uh, our share of experience. And uh, these two cases will be uh, initially presented by uh, my uh, senior resident uh, who will be uh, doing the, uh, uh, presenting the case, uh, Dr. Atul, 
uh, has uh, 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 neurology senior resident finally here, and uh, he's uh, worked on his cases. And uh, I, I would like to give him the opportunity to do the uh, presentation first. Dr. Atul, please. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so I am describing two cases of viral encephalitis. Uh, those who presented with the same presentation, but with a different different diagnosis. So first case is 16 year old female who presented to us with headache of seven days and altered sensorium of last four days. So her headache was initially severe in intensity. It was hollow cranial throbbing. It was issued with phonophobia. She had nausea, vomiting. And this was followed by excessive sleepiness on the fourth day with altered mental function in form of agitated behavior with irrelevant and slurred speech. Although there was no history of any convulsions or focal neurological de uh, deficits, she doesn't have any fever, joint pain or rash, arthralgia or arthritis. And uh, she keep on deteriorating and the, by the seventh day, she had a shortness of breath and hypotension. For that, she was referred to us. And this was her initial x-rays when she presented to us in EMS. And we can see there are bilateral pleural effusion and there is a collapse of both upper lobe of the lungs. And with this x-ray and on examination, she was obese. Uh, she was having a fluid overload st status with, uh, she was odimatous. Uh, there was mild pallor. Air entry was reduced on both sides with the chest full of crafts and her abdominal was distended. She was uh, hypotensive, so started on IV noradrenaline. And uh, she was in the EMS, in the neurological examination, she, she was restless, agitated with uh, GCS of seven. Her pupil uh, were uh, equal reactive. She was moving all the four limbs. Her tone was normal to decreased with uh, bilateral extensor planters. She had uh, some neck rigidity. And uh, with all this presentation, we have initially sent her ABG, which was suggestive of severe acidosis with CO2 narcosis. So she was immediately intubated and was given ventilatory support. Then her uh, all full uh, workup was sent and we kept the possibility of infective etiology uh, as our first uh, differential. And other possibility will be kept as demyelinating maybe and vascular or autoimmune. Uh, with all this, uh, we have done the MRI of her. And in the MRI, we can see uh, uh, these are the D2 flare images uh, which are showing hypointense lesions surrounding by hyperintensities. These are the heterogeneous uh, uh, lesions which are uh, both cortical and subcortical as well as just cortical lesions. So here uh, in the DWA, we can see there are some uh, restricted diffusion. And on uh, maximum intensity projection uh, SWA image, we can see there is blooming. And on face imaging, these are the hyperintense, which suggestive of bleeding in these lesions. And on contrast, uh, uh, there is minimal intake of contrast. And uh, we have sent all the uh, panels. And among the CSF, protein was mildly raised. With glucose was almost normal. Uh, JE, IgM, CMV, IgM, and uh, MTB were negative. And uh, there were 10 cells in the CSF and uh, all lymphocytes, her HSV PCR and scrub typhus PCR were negative. Uh, we have sent all these tests uh, as per the, uh, our recommendation for the tropical fever, which we routinely see in, uh, uh, so her plural fluid, uh, fluid, fluid was also sent, which has 2,100 cells with 90% of the neutrophils. Her sodium was uh, highly elevated of 160 milliequivalent. And potassium was also elevated 5.8. She has hypocalcemia and hyperuricemia. And among the serum, we have repeated JE IgM, which was negative. Her malaria uh, uh, was negative. Her scrub typhus chicken gonia was negative. Her PCT was procalcitonin was 10.8, which suggestive of there are uh, 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 evidence of it. And uh, among the blood investigation, her TLC was also raised of 17,000 with neutrophilic predominant. Her platelet were uh, 1 lakh 53,000. Her ESR was almost normal. With, uh, coagulation profile was normal. Uh, with all these investigations, uh, about, uh, we were not able to reach the diagnosis. Then we set another set of our investigations. And uh, we get serum dengue IgM ELISA, which was repeated two times. It was positive. So finally, we made a diagnosis of dengue hemorrhagic encephalitis with ARDS with secondary sepsis. Uh, she was managed with sporting uh, measures and she started having improvement. And however, after th three weeks of stay, uh, her attendants uh, as requested to shift to nearby hospitals. She was discharged on the GCS of E4M6VT. She was quadriparesis, but she was able to walk with sport. Uh, 
so uh, dengue can uh, uh, dengue can infect uh, infect the cns through blood either by penetrating uh, through blood brain barrier or through the blood csf barrier i will not go into the details of pathogenesis so its neurological manifestation can be secondary to metabolic disturbances which can lead to the encephalopathy or viral invasion which can present as encephalitis meningitis myositis or myelitis or autoimmune reactions which can later present as adam nmo optic neuritis myelitis encephalopathy and gbs so these are the neurological manifestation of a dengue virus these are the various uh, images where how the dengue can uh, affect here we can see there are the uh, hyperintensity in the pons where here we can see the bilateral thalamus hyperintensity uh, which has uh, restricted diffusion on uh, dwi and here we can see involvement of the cerebellum and here we can see there is a meningeal enhancement and this is the uh, mri uh, ls spine where we can see the hyperintensity in the spine so this can be the various presentation of a dengue virus and uh, another case is uh, this is the case. Uh, can can we have a discussion on this case yes, the second case is also yes. dengue fever uh, no sir uh, no sir uh, second uh, case not dengue uh, then we, we, we can, can present that case and then we can have discussion dr murthy on both the cases okay okay because this is a any case will uh, with i thought we can discuss this so another case uh, uh, actually this case uh, uh, for us diagnosis was not a, uh, difficult but more of the uh, management was it was a challenging and uh, patient presented with a uh, same of low grade fever and weakness of 10 days with altered sensorium of 7 days this was followed by seizure from last 3 days so initially she had a, uh, the patient has a low grade fever and which was followed by mental status changes in form of excessive sleepiness and reduced responsiveness and by the end of the week patient has a multiple episode of a complex partial seizures with secondary generalization and following this uh, multiple episode of a seizure which occurred in a day uh, patient become unconscious and was hospitalized so we received this patient and uh, was it was initially managed outside and then we received in comatose state patient was in ventilatory state his gcs was 6 uh, patient pupillary reflexes were retained but sluggish patient was flexic uh, flaccid irreflexic and quadriparatic and this was the mri of the patient and here we can see there are hyper uh, on the t2 flare we can see hyperintensity in the mid brain more on the left side and here on the swa we can see the blooming and here in the t1 images uh, we can see hyperintensity suggestive of uh, subacute bleed and on t2 flare we can see there is a caudal uh, caudal hyperintensity bilateral thalamic hyperintensity there is a global pallidus hypertensity and we can see there is involvement of hippocampal and medial temporal lobe also in these cases and uh, also uh, so we kept the possibility of either japanese encephalitis adam necrotizing or hsv or cvt and uh, among this protein was mildly ra raised of 50 glucose was 70 tp pcr uh, gene expert mtv hsv dengue smv and scrub were negative and uh, her, uh, in the serum chikungunya dengue cmv uh, were negative other investigation were within normal limits and uh, so uh, we were suspecting this je and uh, this patient came out to be positive uh, both in csm crm for je so uh, following our admission uh, patient has further loss of skin agar and and he started having very high urine output and he started having uh, hyponatremia and uh, we started the work up uh, we have a two differential of si idh versus uh, cerebral salt wasting he had a high so uh, sodium in the urine with normal urine osmolality and uh, with normal serum osmolality and hypouricemia so we started managing his fluid intake and output and uh, and uh, it was one of the most difficult to manage the hyponatremia as it lasted for around one month and uh, these are the urine output initially urine output and we started chasing the urine output and we try to keep him in the positive balance and uh, and uh, after a month so uh, we were able to manage his uh, uh, serum sodium and it came to be uh, in the normal limit and uh, with normal uh, 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 urine output and fluid intake and so outcome of this patient was uh, actually we have a many challenging managing this patient uh, he developed uh, uh, many uh, bap he developed some uh, uh, decreased mobility of the joint we have to do a uh, 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 splintage of few joints, and uh, then he was uh, uh, 
ही वॉज माल न्यूट्रिशन फॉर देट वी हैव टू पुट पैक टू तो पेशेंट रिमेन ऑन मैकेनिकल वेंटिलेशन फॉर ए लॉन्ग एंड वींड ऑफ ओवर फोर मंथ्स and this patient was finally discharged after 5 months of neuro neurology icu stay with gcs of e4 m6 vt vt uh, patient was comprehending commands but was quadriparatic akinetic and uh, rigid and was on uh, peg and tracheostomy to uh, after our discharge thank you thank you thank you uh, the first case uh, the, the in, there are cases even recently we saw a case of dengue with multiple uh, microbreeds now uh, the in this case the uh, platelet count is one like uh, it was normal sir throughout the course uh, that, the... that is a little unusual usually dengue fever with intracranial breed will have low platelet counts yes. the another thing there is one pathology study where they have shown um, um, hemorrhage in the demyelinating plaques in a patient with adm following dengue fever uh, the, this unusual feature in this case is uh, platelet count is normal it is normal throughout the course of the hospital yes sir it does sir so that's why we actually did dengue later on not in the initial phase the other uh, meningen cephalitic panels uh, were done earlier and then Uh, because of the uh, presentation dengue was not the first diagnosis we considered and the thalamus and basal ganglia were also uh, free uh, many a time we get an arboviral kind of pattern but uh, that was not the pattern this was cortical subcortical and uh, the, so, the other future i uh, say is there any possibility of press in this patient it may not be detonating this plaques could it be press press with yeah. ml uh it's uh, possible but uh, the the kind of uh, blotches of bleeding we see uh, in uh, such uh, uh, big uh, such big blotches uh, we can get it's not impossible uh, usually because the lesions are mostly posterior uh yes sir mainly posterior we do have anterior lesions also but i agree that we should consider that Any comment from panelists? Any comments from panelists? Also, not uh, might be wanting. Uh, so, your views on this uh, uh, case? Yeah, sure. So, they both were very interesting cases. I was struck by the amount of pulmonary involvement in that patient oh. with the pleural effusions. Uh, Um, I mean, I haven't seen a lot of dengue, but my understanding is sometimes you can get hemoptysis and bleeding into the into the lungs. But this seemed more like an ARDS. And SIT is also yes. Yeah, but uh, is that is that uh, common? This kind of pulmonary involvement is that very unusual? Yeah. In severe dengue, you can have that picture. Uh -huh. Is due to inflammation in the lungs, or is it? Uh, the, this is a va leaky vascular state. Yeah, it's very interesting, and um, so I mean the virus infects the endothelial cells, and that's why you get a lot of hemorrhage right within the brain, and so um, um, it would be of interest to know in these patients if there is um, uh, the extent of viral infection of other cell types within the brain, and what do you really find? Uh, you know? Yeah, we we uh, we. didn't do any uh, direct uh, uh, brain uh, histology that uh, kind of investigations were propagated i we thought probably it's not uh, ethical also since we have no, not in this case in general what do you yeah. find in polish series or autopsy cases uh, so the, both these cases one of the important presentation earlier was a kind of a lethargy uh, like they were became hypersomnia and they both these patients developed and it was not like really kind of coma kind of state they could be easily aroused so excessive sleepiness like uh, sort of we have heard about encephalitis lethargica etc of course this is not that pattern but uh, the initial presentations of becoming extremely sleepy was one common feature seen in uh, both these cases and again the final outcome we, uh, if we do a lot of uh, the maintain some of these patients do recover in fact even the second case we have 
uh, a, a long term follow up he is uh, now that is that je case he is now able to sit up and uh, there is some postal problem but he has achieved some postal balance and he is able to uh, listen to or comprehend even though his speech has not come and he is still on request to meet you but i am feeling that those who reach that far will uh, are no longer uh, with that term pvs is out now they were all, he was almost in a vegetative state but he has recovered very well and he is on continuing to recover so th that is uh, something very satisfying uh, as a clinician and we it also let us learn a lot about uh, how even very severe brain uh, damage the brain by its own we can take some credit but then actually the the remarkable ability of the brain to uh, repair itself and to recover that's amazing we just give good uh, supportive uh, treatment uh, probably that je patient has uh, post encephalitic parkinson disease yes sir. he has got we, we would very well complication we don't know he might persist also yeah. generally they do recover but some amount of the deficit yes, will sir. be left yes sir quite like this is there any more comments from panelists before we close the uh, session and give the mic to dr mashram uh, i think uh, we had a great session and uh, just uh, over time but i would like to thank professor ravindranath and dr uh, augustina dr murthy uh, dr farah and all presentations a great presentation by sunil narayan atul goel and of course by michael young and kevin kyle and uh, i would like to thank uh, uh, other panelists uh, were there professor grisor professor uh, steu and dr gagan uh, i can see rahul also so it's a great uh, uh, session another session and the last session in this series we have on 5th of september like next saturday and uh, then we'll have a break of two weeks and we again start from 26th september all our residents are watching all this program we conducted a tropical uh, neurology uh, national conference in 2010 professor muti was also one of our guests actually so we do see very amazing kaleidoscopic picture of tropical neurological problems here uh, so uh, very enlightening very enjoyable yeah. and, uh, thank you dr yeah we are getting uh, you know people for presentation and uh, talks from all over the world and uh, the people all over the world are watching and enjoying the session and thank you very much and we meet you again uh, next saturday thank you masram for giving us a chance thank you very much thank you, thank you and good bye thank you thank you professor grisol thank you augustina Thank you everyone thanks a lot see you again thank you farah thank you thank you thank you everyone thank you steve thank you amazing session thanks so oh, much thank you thank you see you next week सर एंड करते सेशन में हां ठीक है कई स्टीव कई डॉक्टर मेशम थैंक यू वेरी मच वंस अगेन या थैंक यू थैंक यू स्टीव वाज वांटेड टू स्पीक समथिंग या बट ही गॉट डिस्कनेक्टेड आई थिंक हां ओके गुड हां ठीक है वी एंड द सेशन या आई एल एंड द सेशन सर थैंक यू थैंक यू